Hello, I'm Dr. Kenneth Taylor. I'm director of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center at Piedmont, and I'm here today to talk to you about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, here's the outline of our conversation today. We'll give you a little background on the history and prevalence, definition and differential diagnosis, as well as some conversation about pathophysiology. We'll talk about how to identify patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and then a fair amount of discussion on the contemporary diagnosis and uh, therapeutics available for these patients. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about assessment of risk and outcomes, and then some on athletics and exercise recommendations, and then finally a little discussion about our center here at Piedmont. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common genetic abnormality seen in cardiology, and uh, it is oftentimes in the public venue. Um, these are photographs of two very famous uh, athletes, Hank Gathers and Reggie Lewis, both of whom who died, one of them on national television, and uh, were ultimately diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so not only is this an important subject for doctors taking care of patients, but it's oftentimes a subject that comes into the public venue. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common reason why young athletes die. Um, and looking at this graph, you can see that the almost 50% of, of the etiology of uh, sudden cardiac death in young athletes is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was first officially described in the literature in the 1950s out of London, though there had been sporadic uh, mentions of this disorder, but going back into the 1800s. Um, over 50 years later, in 2011, the AHAACC finally came out with a set of guidelines, and a lot of what we'll talk about today comes out of the guidelines. Um, a new set of guidelines will be coming up this fall, so we'll have a new set of data uh, coming up this year. As I mentioned, it's the most common genetic cardiovascular disorder, uh, with the phenotype estimated at about 0.2% of the general population, which is over uh, half a million uh, people affected in the U.S. Um, although that's a fair number of patients, any one practicing individual practitioner may see very few patients in their practice. And there are many patients who remain unidentified. And in fact, it's estimated that this number is probably an underestimate. When you add in people who are genotypically positive but phenotypically negative, or patients who have not been identified, the incidence is probably closer to 0.6%, or well over one in 500. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is defined as LV hypertrophy, or thickening of the heart muscle, associated with a non-dilated ventricular chamber. In the absence of another systemic disease or cardiac abnormality that can cause hypertrophy, typically with a definition of a wall thickness of greater than 15 millimeters. Um, HCM, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is the current accepted definition or term for this disorder. Uh, there have been a lot of terms over the years, uh, most notably IHSS, HOCAM, and many others. Uh, but because not all patients are obstructive and not all patients involve the, the septum, um, HCM is the preferred uh, term. Here's some pathology showing some kind of typical and uh, uh, pathological thickening. Um, on the right, you see a short axis uh, with the very, very markedly thickened septum. You can see it's set thicker than the, septal, the posterior wall. This is a typical septal variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And on the left is a more generalized hypertrophy ventricle. Um, there are a lot of things that can cause thickening of the heart muscle. Probably the most common is patients who have chronic renal failure, especially those on dialysis, um, can get significant hypertrophy, and sometimes that can be difficult to distinguish. We'll talk a little bit about the athlete's heart in a moment. There are a number of infiltrative disorders and more unusual diagnoses that uh, can be picked up occasionally, like Fabry's disease or, more commonly, amyloidosis. Um, when people do high competitive athletics and are very well-trained athletes, they can develop thickening of their heart muscle and sometimes even dilatation of their heart chambers. Um, and this so-called athlete's heart can sometimes be difficult to distinguish from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's this kind of gray zone with LV wall thickness in the 13 to 15 millimeter range. Uh, 
Typically, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will tend to have slightly smaller cavities, more abnormal EKGs or bizarre EKGs, um, typically more likely to be symptomatic or have a family history. Athletes, on the other hand, um, will tend to have slight dilatation of their heart, will have less abnormal EKGs. Um, if you decondition them, their thickness um, and cavity changes actually will change. Um, and they're obviously athletes, so their VO2 maxes are usually very high. Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can present in a lot of different ways. Uh, many patients with this disorder will live a normal life without need for major therapeutic interventions. Um, they may be picked up by an asymptomatic abnormal EKG, a murmur heard on examination, as part of a screening program for athletes. Um, a family history evaluation if a family member has been diagnosed with the disease, uh, either a family history of sudden cardiac death or syncope either in the patient or the patient's family, uh, symptom evaluation for shortness of breath or chest pain, atrial fibrillation, and oftentimes as an incidental finding um, for imaging for another cause. The pathophysiology of this disorder has several different components, and we'll go through each one of these. Left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, diastolic dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, myocardial ischemia, and mitral regurgitation. Classic obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a dynamic process. Uh, the septum of the heart is eccentrically thickened, and during systole, it moves into the outflow tract, which is the area of the heart where blood is trying to get out of the ventricle. And by moving into this space, it creates an obstruction or a narrowing, which accelerates blood and creates a, a pressure differential between inside of the heart and outside of the heart. Um, this pressure differential is dynamic, and it depends on preload, afterload, and inotropy. Uh, which means that how well the heart is filled or what it's uh, expelling against or the degree of uh, contractility will all affect the degree of dynamic obstruction. Um, in addition, there's this concept called the Venturi effect where the mitral valve, which is on the other side of the septum, is essentially sucked into the outflow tract because of the accelerating column of blood through the outflow tract. And by being pulled into the outflow tract, it actually contributes to the obstruction um, and creates this concept called SAM, or systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, which we'll see in a moment, um, which contributes to obstruction. So here is a echo image. The left ventricle is up here. The left atrium is here. This is the mitral valve, and here is the aortic outflow tract, and you can see this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve during systole gets sucked into the outflow tract and actually makes contact with the septum, and that's contributing to the obstruction in this patient. Um, and we can measure that with a Doppler signal, um, and that Doppler signal can measure the degree of obstruction and the degree of gradient across the outflow tract, um, and that Obstruction, as I said, is dependent on preload and afterload. So with Valsalva maneuver or amyl nitrate, you can increase the gradient by, by affecting preload and afterload. The degree of obstruction that a patient may have does affect their outcomes. And these are data uh, from Marty Marin suggesting that patients who are obstructive have poorer outcomes in terms of heart failure, death, and stroke compared to those who are non-obstructive. Autonomic dysfunction is present in about a quarter of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and it's typically seen as a failure to increase blood pressure or a drop in blood pressure with ex exercise. It's associated with a poor prognosis, and it's one of the reasons why we use exercise testing to uh, assess risk for uh, sudden cardiac death. Um, and it may be an abnormal reflex response to obstruction. Diastolic dysfunction is very common in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As you can imagine, uh, these ventricles are thick and become stiff, and in becoming stiff, uh, have problems with diastolic filling. Um, the hypertrophied myocardium results in increased chamber stiffness, um, and this can worsen with exercise or uh, other catecholamine stimulation. Um, 
these are echo images showing mitral inflow and tissue Doppler, um, and we see a classically restrictive pattern in the mitral inflow and a small E prime and thus large E E prime ratio suggesting poor diastolic function. Um, myocardial ischemia is common in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, usually seen in a subendocardial pattern and frequently not in a pattern of coronary disease. And this is caused by a supply-demand mismatch. Essentially, the heart muscle is thickened enough where blood flow has a hard time getting from the epicardial surface to the endocardial surface, both because of the thickened myocardium and because of thickening of arterials. Um, and this can lead to myocardial dysfunction and even uh, myocardial infarctions in the absence of coronary artery disease. Mitral regurgitation is most commonly seen in the obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it is typically a secondary phenomenon. As we talked about the uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, the mitral valve is pulled into the outflow tract and that opens the valve a little bit and allows for regurgitation. It's typically seen in a more posterior, po posterior lateral direction, opposite from the anterior leaflet, which is sucked into the outflow tract, um, and is typically related to the proportion of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So the more obstruction you get, the more mitral regurgitation you get. So it will also be dynamic depending on preload, afterload, and inotropy. So here is an example of mitral regurgitation. Again, here's the left ventricle, the left atrium. Here's the mitral valve. The outflow tract's to the left in this image. And you can see the anterior leaflet being sucked into the outflow tract. And uh, the Doppler signal here shows the mitral regurgitation coming in this direction. This is a transesophageal echo showing the same thing. Again, in this case, the left ventricle is down here. The aortic valve and outflow tract are up here. Here is the mitral regurgitant jet going in a posterior, posterior lateral direction away from the anterior leaflet. Um, when we put Doppler signals on these in the echo lab, we get different kinds of uh, morphologies. And sometimes these two jets, the mitral regurgitant jet and the outflow tract uh, jet, are very close to each other. And distinguishing them is very important because the velocities are different. A mitral regurgitant jet tends to be a much higher velocity. And so we look at different morphologies. This is an outflow tract obstruction jet, and this is an MR jet. And it's important because if you get an MR jet, you may find a gradient that looks like it's in the 120, 150 range, whereas the outflow tract may actually be only 30. And so distinguishing these is, is quite important in the echo lab. Physical exam findings, classic for obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a harsh systolic murmur, usually heard at the base of the heart, um, can be made worse, again, with things that decrease preload and decrease afterload. Um, you may have an S4 gallop. Um, Non-obstructive forms may have the gallop but may not have a, a murmur. Um, you may see a rapid upstroke or a so-called pulsus bisphyrians with a spike and dome pulse. And then you also may hear an MR murmur separate from the outflow tract murmur. Um, EKGs in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are classically abnormal, suggesting left ventricular hypertrophy, and oftentimes with marked T-wave abnormalities, especially the apical forms, which will give you the kind of the most bizarre looking EKGs. You may also see this dagger-like septal Q wave seen in the inferior and inferior lateral uh, uh, leads. Um, there are a number of different patterns of hypertrophy, uh, which is why we call it hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, not IHSS. Um, there are several common ones that we'll look at in a second. Um, any hypertrophy in any part of the heart uh, can be involved. Um, the classic ones are reverse curvature septum, sigmoid septum, neutral septum, apical, and midventricular, mid and we'll look at each of those. So this is a typical reverse curve septum. This is, these are echo images on the top and MRI images on the bottom, where you have this big swooping curve with a very thick septum. Um, here is a live version of uh, that morphology, showing the massively uh, thickened septum. Um, here is just another image of short axis showing that very markedly thickened septum. This looks a lot like the pathology I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Um, a sigmoid septum is kind of the classic uh, 
subaortic uh, obstruction where you get this focal uh, thickening right under the aortic valve or right in the outflow tract with classic systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Um, here's an echo and here are MRI images showing this during diastole and during systole. You can actually see the mitral septal contact and a little mitral regurgitation here. Um, neutral septum is kind of a variant of that where it's, the septum is thickened a little bit more throughout the septum. Um, apical forms are quite common and oftentimes elude uh, diagnosis for some time, although they will typically have a very abnormal EKG. Um, sometimes echo can be difficult to distinguish. Uh, MRI is very good in this particular case to see the apical hypertrophy. Um, here is a video of an apical hypertroph, and their cavity will classically have this, what's described as a spade pattern. It looks like a spade on a playing card with the point up top and kind of this round part at the bottom. And you can see the massive hypertrophy up at the apex. Um, and then mid-cavity is actually pretty common where you have thickening in the mid portion of the ventricle and it will oftentimes lead to the development of apical aneurysms. Um, cutting off blood supply to the apex results in actually an apical infarct. And you can see that really well here on this MRI. And here on this echo, here's a mid-cavity hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with evidence of a small apical aneurysm. Um, let's talk about some diagnostic testing. So stress testing is very common to do in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We use it as a way to help risk stratify for risk for sudden cardiac death. Um, and it's considered reasonable uh, to look at both blood pressure response and functional capacity for symptoms. Um, though, in reality, we will typically uh, add an echo to the stress test and do a stress echo. If you look at uh, patients with obstructive form or possibly obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's a classic teaching of a third, a third, a third. The third will be non-obstructive, a third will have obstruction at rest, and a third will have no obstruction at rest, but with provocation, specifically with exercise, they'll develop obstruction. So two-thirds of patients will have obstruction either at rest or with exercise. Um, there are a number of things that can provoke a gradient in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we can see it, um, including post-PVC response, a so-called Brockenbrow sign, isoproteranol infusion, amyl nitrate, valsalva, or dobutamine. None of these mechanisms should be used for management decisions or clinical decisions. They are not physiologic and they should not be used for making decisions about therapy. Stress echo is what should be used for making decisions about therapy. Um, it is the key test which defines the patient's natural history and management and should be considered in as a routine evaluation of all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, particularly if they don't have a resting gradient. And the reason for that is, and again, these are data from Marty Marin, that if you look at a group of patients who do not have obstruction at rest, who have low gradients, a third of them will significantly increase their gradients with exercise, even though they didn't have a gradient at rest. And this can, can significantly contribute to patient symptoms. Here's an echo image of a baseline and stress, and you can see at baseline the outflow tract is open, but with stress you develop dynamic uh, outflow tract obstruction and systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And here is the resting gradient, which is low, and then with exercise it goes up very high. Um, so we've talked a bit about echo, which is really the primary first uh, line of evaluation of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, we are now using a lot of MRI. MRI is uh, very specific about giving us a lot of information on the morphology and the, um, the pathology associated with this disorder. Um, it can be used if you have an echo that's inconclusive. It can help with alternative diagnoses such as Fabry's disease or infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Um, it gives us a lot of information on morphology, the particular type, how thick the heart is, uh, whether there are associated mitral valve abnormalities, um, and specifically it gives us information on something called late gadolinium enhancement. Um, which is essentially scarring of the heart, and as we'll see in a moment, uh, has impacts on outcomes. So here are some MRI images, uh, similar to what we just looked at, showing the different forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, including 
massive septal hypertrophy, the classic focal subvalvular, uh, apical, eccentric, and uh, an apical aneurysm, as well as showing this uh, late gadolinium enhancement or scar tissue that we see. Um, Holter monitoring, EKG monitoring, is considered a class one indication in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They are at risk for arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, so we need to monitor them for it. And it is considered a class one indication to do. And then every couple of years, it's uh, reasonable to repeat if you're following someone trying to reassess their risks. Uh, genetic counseling is a, also a class one indication. That's not necessarily genetic testing, but counseling. This is a genetic disease, so it's very important to screen family members for this disorder. Um, and it's considered a class one indication to evaluate the familial inheritance and genetic counseling in patients in their families. Um, and what the guidelines allow for is screening either clinically with or without genetic testing uh, of first degree relatives with this disorder. Um, genetic testing is available. And uh, the genetics of this disorder are typically an autosomal dominant, though there are sporadic mutations. Um, there are over 15 culprit genes that have been identified, but there are four major ones that tend to come up when you do genetic testing on this population. Um, and they're genes that code for uh, cardiac beta myosin heavy chain, cardiac myosin binding protein C, and two uh, troponin, troponin I, troponin T genes. Um, there are a lot of variants and uh, variants that we don't really know what they mean. We call them variants of unknown significance. You cannot use genetics to prognosticate sudden cardiac death outcomes. Um, the guidelines allow for kind of two pathways for screening family members. One is a genetic pathway and one is a clinical pathway. Um, as you follow this um, decision bracket, you'll see that there are kind of some problems with the genetic pathway. So let's just go through this. The first option and the one that most people follow is the clinical option, where if you have the HCM phenotype, then you continue to follow family members, first degree relatives, with um, clinical imaging, echo and EKG. If you decide to go with the uh, genetic testing, here's what the issues are. Let's say you have somebody and you do a genetic test on them. Let's say you do a genetic test on 100 patients. If you do that, one third of them, you will get a gene. You'll get an abnormal gene. So you can then use that screen gene to screen family members. The problem is, is if you get a family member and they have a mutation, then they're genetically positive. If they have not shown evidence of the disease, you need to follow them with continued surveillance with echoes and EKGs. If they are negative, then there's a high likelihood that they don't have the disease. So this small area is the one place that genetic testing might allow you not to do clinical surveillance. Though there's still sporadic mutations, so it's not 100%. Two thirds of patients who are genetically tested, so if you test 100 patients, two thirds of them, you'll either get a negative test or what's called a variant of unknown significance. And if you have those, you cannot use that to screen their family members. So their family members still have to undergo echo and EKG. So if you look at this, the vast majority of patients will still fall into a bucket where they need to be followed with uh, a clinical following. So that's why a lot of programs will kind of shy away from doing genetic testing. Um, the screening for family members, if they're children or pre-adolescent, is typically uh, every 12 to 18 months up to ages 18 to 21. Um, and then as adults, it's every five years to age 60. So genetic testing um, has a 2A indication as reasonable for identifying family members. It's not indicative of... Um, uh, not indicated when an index patient doesn't have a definitive mutation. So if you get one of the two-thirds that's either a variant of unknown significance or a negative uh, gene, then you can't then use that to screen family members. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is very common arrhythmia in general, and it's the most common arrhythmia we see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it tends to occur earlier in this disorder. Um, 
There are a number of antiarrhythmic drugs that can be useful and particularly helpful, particularly in obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, amiodarone, sotolol, disapyramide. Um, Long-term outcomes suggest that ablative procedures are useful, and the risk of stroke is about almost 1% per year. The important take-home from atrial fibrillation and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that the CHADS-VAS scoring system has not been validated, so patients with this disorder, regardless of their age or their CHADS-VAS score, need to be anticoagulated. Um, as far as treatment is concerned, the first-line therapy for this disorder is beta blockers. Their negative inotropic properties and uh, enhanced relaxation are useful in, in the pathophysiology of this disorder. We typically titrate them to maximally tolerated doses, and a lot of times these patients, particularly obstructive form of this disorder, require very high doses. You do have to watch out for hypotension and AV block. Verapamil um, also has a, an indication and is used either on its own if beta blockers are a problem or as additive therapy, and there are a lot of patients who are on both beta blockers and verapamil. Again, you have to be careful about AV block and hypotension. Disopyramide is kind of a third line drug. You don't want to use it on its own. It does have some issues with QT prolongation and anticholinergic side effects. Um, you have to be careful with uh, pure vasodilators like nifedipine. Again, if you drop afterload too much in an obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, you can create increasing gradients. Um, and anything that increases inotropy, so you've got to avoid, especially in the hospital, things like dopamine, dobutamine, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine in these patients. Diuretics are sometimes used. You have to be careful in the obstructive form. If you drop preload, um, you can worsen gradients, so you've got to be very careful. Um, we do use them, but we're, we're very careful about it. So if you have a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with symptoms, we'll assess their uh, gradient, and then if, they if they're non-obstructive at rest, we'll do a stress echo. If they're non-obstructive, then they'll be typically managed with meds, depending on their degree of symptoms and or um, uh, other comorbidities. Um, if they're obstructive, again, we institute drugs and we'll use beta blockers, verapamil, and or norpace if needed, and then reassess. If they are symptomatically okay, we will follow them on medical therapy. If they're not, then we'll talk about potential septal reduction therapy. In the non-obstructive form, they, some percentage of them can progress to dilated cardiomyopathy and need to be evaluated for transplant at end stage. The criteria for septal reduction therapy, of which there are two that we'll talk about, um, are severe symptoms, so persistent New York Heart Association class 3 plus symptoms, and an outflow tract gradient at rest or with exercise of over 50 millimeters of mercury on optimal medical therapy. So the current guidelines recommend that you have to really have all three of these to consider septal reduction therapy. Um, so there are kind of two major uh, ways of reducing the septum in patients with obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The one we have the most data on and the longest standing is septal myomectomy, where a surgeon goes in and basically cuts out the thickened part of the heart muscle and addresses any mitral valve issues that might be there. When we look at people who have had myomectomy compared to people who have not, who are obstructive, their outcomes are markedly improved. And in fact, there are data that suggest that their outcomes go back to population-based expected survival curves compared to obstructive non-operated patients. So we have very good long-term outcome on surgical septal myomectomy. The other approach is something called alcohol septal ablation, where you do a heart cath and you find the blood vessel that feeds the septum and then you instill alcohol and create essentially a heart attack and infarct that area, which causes it to shrink down and relieves obstruction. And there are good data that alcohol septal ablation does relieve obstruction in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in fact, outcome data in terms of survival compared to myomectomy seem to be similar. Um, there are some differences though. Um, patients who undergo alcohol septal ablation are at increased risk for requiring re repeat procedures of some sort, either another alcohol septal ablation or a myomectomy, um, to the tune of about 10%. And in fact, what we see is early on after an alcohol septal ablation, there are increased risk of VT and VF. If you think about it, scar tissue may be the, f the cause of arrhythmias and you're creating a scar in these patients.
High degree of e-block is seen in about 10% requiring either pacemaker or defibrillator. Um, a relatively high rate, 10% of repeat procedures. Some degree of anatomic inflexibility. You're kind of stuck with whatever septal perforator you have. Um, and it's, there's no ability to address other issues. So if you have mitral valve abnormalities or atrial fibrillation or coronary disease requiring bypass surgery, those cannot be ev evaluated. Um, what we don't know is if the short-term follow-up is gradient and symptom relief sufficient and long-lasting. And so when one looks at the guidelines, um, septal reduction therapy is indicated uh, for patients, again, with the symptoms and gradients as noted. Um, and the guidelines say that it should be performed at a center that is experienced with both. Um, and septal myomectomy should be the first consideration for the majority of patients. Um, and so it, it leans towards myomectomy because of the data I just showed you. Um, for patients who are elderly or their contraindications or their surgical risk is too high, then alcohol septal ablation in a center that's uh, qualified and does a lot of them um, is, is considered acceptable. Um, and then the, they do allow for after a comprehensive, balanced and thorough discussion with patients about risks, benefits and outcomes, that if a patient says, I do not want surgery, I want the alcohol septal ablation, it's allowed. But if you notice, it's a 2B indication, not a 2A indication. Um, it should not be done necessarily in patients who have no symptoms or normal exercise tolerance. So should, we, we really should not be doing this on asymptomatic patients. Um, it should be part of a comprehensive program that looks at appropriate therapy evaluation and outcomes. Um, it should not be done with patients who have concomitant disease, so patients who have mitral valve abnormalities or need bypass surgery or other uh, surgical things, uh, alcohol septal ablation probably should not be considered. Septal myomectomy is preferred. Um, and the guidelines will steer away from alcohol septal ablation for young patients, particularly under the age of 21, and, and discouraged in adults less than 40. There are a number of pathological abnormalities that are seen that lend themselves to surgical myomectomy over alcohol septal ablation. So mitral valve abnormality, um, particularly of the papillary muscle and mid-cavitary obstruction, intrinsic mitral valve disease, a long anterior leaflet that attaches uh, high up um, and contributes to the obstruction. You may be able to remove the septal uh, thickening, but not the mitral valve cord or massive hypertrophy. Mitral valve abnormalities were not part of the initial description of this disorder in the 1950s, but over the last uh, 50 plus years, we've learned that they actually contribute a fair amount to this disorder. Um, and there have been abnormalities identified at every location along the mitral valve, including the leaflets, the submitral apparatus, and the papillary muscles and cordi. Um, in 1989, Barry Marin described 52 elderly patients with this disorder that had a different morphological feature. They were mostly female. They had modest hypertrophy. They had been relatively well compensated until their sixth or seventh decades. They typically had a calcified annulus, and they had a slightly different mechanism of their systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. As opposed to that kind of classic bending that we saw in the earlier echoes, the entire mitral apparatus kind of moves towards the septum and contributes to obstruction. And what he found was that these patients did not do well with, well with medical therapy, and those that did get operated on did much better. Um, here's uh, some echoes of the two different morphologies I was just talking about. Okay, let's try that again. So on the left, you'll see the kind of classic subaortic hypertrophy with uh, the septal and, uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve uh, and obstruction, and you can see the, the valve being pulled up into the output tract. On the right is this other morphology where this anterior mitral valve cord comes down and contacts, but the, you, you don't see that same bending of the, um, uh, of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And in fact, you see mitral annual calcification here. Um, this is a patient of mine who had this disorder, and this is, uh, I followed her for a long time um, and struggled with her symptomatically. And you can see that she doesn't have the classic SAM, but she had significant outflow tract obstruction. 
um, and was very, very symptomatic. And after a long time, we finally operated on her at a little higher risk because she's an older woman. Um, but she had a great operation with uh, septal reduction and uh, reformation of the mitral valve. And here's her echo now showing no obstruction, a wide open outflow tract, and the, the mitral uh, apparatus is no longer obstructing. And she's done incredibly well. All right, let's talk a little bit about risk for sudden cardiac death. Uh, the arrhythmias is probably the most common reason why patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy die, and they can die suddenly. And we do evaluate their risk for sudden cardiac death. There are a number of uh, clinical features that increase that risk, including prior VT or arrest, family history of sudden cardiac death in a first degree relative, LV wall thickness of greater than 30, recent unexplained syncope, non-sustained VTAC, or blood pressure response to exercise. And we add these up and use them to help decide whether an ICD is recommended or is reasonable. Um, or not recommended. Um, and so we can use these clinical features to put people into the highest risk, and those in the highest risk we evaluate for defibrillators. Um, it turns out, and, and those people at the lowest risk, of course, we can just follow. Um, it turns out that MRI and this concept of late gadolinium enhancement has helped us with this assessment. And what we see is that the more scar tissue you have in your heart, the more likely you are to have arrhythmias. Um, so this correlates late gadolinium and enhancement with degree of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Um, and in fact, Marty Marin uh, studied over 1,200 patients and found that the degree of LGE correlated to the risk of sudden cardiac death um, and essentially came up with a threshold of about 15%. And so with MRI, you can quantitate how much scar tissue is there. And if it's over 15%, that's another risk factor for consideration of an ICD. Um, and those with zero fall into the lowest category, um, and under 10% probably in an intermediate category for which we will continue to monitor. Let's talk a little bit about athletes. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the most common reason why young athletes die, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, uh, uh, should not uh, allow people to participate in competitive athletics. We screen a lot of athletes. And if they have this disorder, it's typically um, will take them out of highly competitive athletics. Um, the guidelines will say that if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you should be doing only low impact athletics. Um, and this is a graph showing static component and dynamic component. And basically, it puts if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you go in this bucket, which allows you to bowl, play cricket curl, play golf, do riflery or yoga. Um, and so all these other athletics are kind of knocked out in the, in the guidelines. Um, most people in this field feel like that's probably not great for the overall health of our population. If you let people sit around and just play golf and do much, not do much else, they will typically get obese, develop diabetes, and other uh, heart-related problems. And so there's kind of a movement within the hypertrophic world to think about how can we let our patients exercise. Um, low intensity exercise is allowed in the guidelines, but we have now have data that moderate intensity exercise may actually be safe and potentially beneficial. There is some debate in the high intensity arena, um, and there are people who um, are talking about allowing our patients to do more moderate uh, intensity, um, particularly aerobic, sub um, anaerobic exercise to allow for uh, cardiovascular fitness and conditioning. Um, and there's this thought that inactivity is probably not good, that light and moderate recreational activity may be beneficial. But when we start to get into vigorous or highly intensive competitive athletics, uh, we need to have really shared decision making. Um, uh, and to that end, we have a sports cardiology uh, division that we work with. Dr. Mashman is part of a group of physicians that in our whole sports medicine uh, division. Um, and so we work very closely with them in trying to evaluate athletes. So let's finish with a discussion of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center at Piedmont. Um, we are a multidisciplinary team to assess patients with this disorder. Um, including cardiologists with knowledge of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the guidelines, CT surgery with interest in septal myomectomy, imaging including MRI, echo, and nuclear, 
EP, interventional cardiology with expertise in alcohol septal ablation, sports cardiology, and possibly genetics. Um, and we offer guideline-directed therapy based on comprehensive evaluation and treatment plans for patients and families with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, including um, evaluation of risk for sudden cardiac death, need for defibrillators, optimization of medical therapy, and appropriate use of septal reduction therapy. And our goal here is to standardize the therapy and provide state-of-the-art care uh, in a very consistent way so all patients have access to the same level of care. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, any one practitioner may only have one or two patients with this disorder. And if you have a lot of practitioners with a few patients, you will oftentimes get somewhat degree of inconsistency in their care. And so what we're trying to do is create a consistent platform where all patients can get the standard level of guideline-directed therapy. Um, we are hoping to uh, increase referrals both within the Piedmont system and locally and eventually become a regional center for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in hopes of eventually obtaining certification by the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association as a center of excellence. Um, we hope to be involved in uh, research and will continue to work with our sports cardiology uh, colleagues to help define and create uh, protocols for young athletes. Um, we have defined pathways for standardizing the management of these patients, and we are currently seeing consults in four locations, including Athens, Fayette, uh, Atlanta, and Blairsville. Um, we have a CT surgeon and an interventional cardiologist identified as experts for septal reduction therapy. Um, this is one of many pathways we've come up with, which kind of shows a flow of patients where they get an initial evaluation, advanced imaging, uh, family screening, EP consultation, medical optimization, and then depending on their symptoms, potentially interventional uh, consultation. So who to call for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Uh, we have four identified uh, cardiologists with uh, special interest and expertise in this is disorder. Uh, myself in Atlanta, uh, Andrew Darlington in the Fayette area, uh, Matthew Krim in Athens, and Chuck Campbell in Blairsville. Um, Bruce Stambler has helped us with the EP protocols, though any of our electrophysiologists are available for consultation. Um, our surgeon is Vinod Thirani, who has a lot of experience with septal myomectomies. And Pradeep Yadav is our interventionalist with a lot of experience with alcohol septal ablations. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention today. Um, if I can be of any assistance, please reach out to me, uh, and um, we're happy to help with any of your patients. Have a nice day.